In this session of Orthodoxy 101, we are returning once again to the story of the Church, the age of the councils. We will be discussing in this session the sixth and seventh ecumenical councils and their historical perspective and their impact on the history of the Church. The Sixth Ecumenical Council was called in 681 in the city of Constantinople. What were the significant issues that allowed or rather necessitated the calling of the council? The primary concerns of this council, the Sixth Council, were again, Christological. There had grown up in the church the concept of monothelitism. In other words, one will. Monothelitism taught that Christ only had one will, the divine, and that that will overpowered and overshadowed his human will. The makeup of the council, the Sixth Council, was that it was called by the Emperor Constantine IV. Over 670 bishops uh, attended, and there was representation not only from Constantinople, but from Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, and Jerusalem. This provided that representation from all of the apostolic churches were represented in the council. The council met in the triulo of the imperial palace in Constantinople. What was the historical background that uh, was behind the council? First and foremost, the emperor empire was under attack from Muslims. The Muslim religion grew up at this time in Arabia and spread into the Near East, affecting the church all over the Near Eastern parts of the empire. Monothelites are those people that felt that the divine will of Christ was overpowering the human will. This, this concept was popular in the East, both in Persia and Syria. In 649, a synod held, held in Rome condemned both monoergism, or one energy, and monothelitism, which is one will. At this time, the Pope of Rome was Agatho, the Patriarch of Constantinople was George I, and Makarios was the Patriarch of Antioch. During this time, there was an attempt to compromise between the Chalcedonian and the Monophysite churches of the East. That attempt basically described that Christ had two natures, which was the Chalcedonian uh, teaching, fully God and fully man, but only had one energy, and that that energy of Christ, though existing in two natures, was the divine energy. And this was an attempt to satisfy the monophysite concept. This was first accepted by Antioch, Alexandria, and Constantinople, as well as the Armenian church. But Rome basically sat on the sidelines. Ultimately, the churches did not accept this. So who were the champions of the Orthodox position? The significant champion was Saint Sophronios, Patriarch of Jerusalem, and he was 
Uh, he lived between 560 and 638 AD and was patriarch of, Con of excuse me, of uh, Jerusalem from 634 to 638 AD. He was a champion of the Orthodox position and is a saint of the church. What did Saint Sophronios produce that provided the theological uh, foundation for the council? His theological works defended both two energies and two wills. Uh, he also wrote various poems and engomions. The engomions were tracts or writings that praised and described the lives of the saints. In uh, addition to these, these writings, he wrote us and something that we continue to focus on, uh, most especially during Great Lent. He wrote the basic story and uh, description of the life of St. Mary of Egypt. What was monothelitism? It basically taught that Christ had one will, that is, that there was no opposition in Christ between his human and divine will. The divine was so overpowering that it minimized the human will of Christ. This doctrine was accepted in most of the Byzantine world, but was opposed by Sophronios in Jerusalem and additionally in Rome. It began the controversy that persisted even until the loss of the reconquered province and the death of the emperor Heraclitus, Heraclitus. This was significant in that these were the areas that the Muslim religion was gaining uh, strength and was uh, and that was becoming a significant force in the empire at this time. Who were the champions against one will of Christ? First and foremost, we have Maximus the Confessor. He lived from 580 AD to August 13th, 662 AD. His writings included the Ambigua, the, which was a primary work on the theory and the theology of Christology. He wrote centuries on love and on theology. Uh, the name of the work was Centuries. He wrote commentaries on both the Psalms and on scriptures. The writings of, uh, of Maximus called the Mystagogi was a commentary on the divine liturgy. He wrote a tract on the life of the Theotokos and much of the books called the that we know today called the Philokalia are of the writings of Maximus. The other hero of this controversy was Pope Martin of Rome, Saint Martin, who fell asleep in 655. He was Pope of Rome from 649 to 653. And he called and convened the Lateran Council that, read, that met in 650. Both Maximus and Martin were confessors for the faith. They were condemned by the Emperor Constance II, who declared and supported the one will concept of Christ. They were both tortured and exiled. They were confessors. In other words, they suffered physically for the faith and for their perspective. 
Both of them participated in the Lateran Council in 649, which finally vindicated the rulings of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Both were named saints shortly after the Lateran Council. Maximus Saint Maximus the Confessor is commemorated both on January 21st and on the day of his falling asleep, August 13th. Martin of Rome, Saint Martin of Rome, is commemorated on the 14th day of April. The Council of Constantinople was called to decide the, the issue of the wills of Christ. It decided and defined that Christ post, excuse me, possessed both two energies and two wills, but that the human was in subjection to the divine and all-powerful will. It accepted the writings and definition of Pope Agatho. It condemned both one energy and one will as heretical, including those who had supported this heresy, including Pope, Pope Sergios of Constantinople. The Church commemorates the Holy Fathers of the Sixth Ecumenical Council on January 23rd and also on the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, when the Sunday of all the fathers of the first six councils are commemorated. What did the council, the sixth council, actually decree? The conciliar language basically is this, believing our Lord Jesus Christ, even after his incarnation, to be one of the Holy Trinity, our true God, we say that he has two natures shining forth in one essence, in which he demonstrated the miracles and, the, and his suffering throughout his entire providential dwelling here, not in appearance, but in truth. The difference of natures being made known in the same one substance, in that each nature, each will, and performs the things that are proper to it in a communion with the other. Then, in accord with this reasoning, we hold that the two natural wills and principal actions meet in correspondence for the salvation of the human race. This clearly indicates that Christ had not only two wills, but also two, but also two energies. This was the basic teachings and the basic understandings coming out of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. We come now to the time of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The end of the eighth century, 787. The Seventh Ecumenical Council was called in the city of Nicaea, it being the second council to be held in this city. As you can see from the uh, map, Nicaea is not too far from the city of Constantinople, and it, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, was called to deal with the issue of iconoclasm. The background for this council is the Emperor Leo attacked the use of icons as idolatry. The iconoclastic period began in the history of the empire around the year 726. Uh, at this time, icons were deemed to be idolatry. They were, because the emperor was so influential, he decreed that icons be removed 
from churches and from homes, and it grew to develop an opponent to his teachings and to his pr proclamations, and those opponents are known today as Iconodules, Iconodulis, which are servants of icons. The primary opposition to the uh, iconoclastic tendencies were monastic and centered in the monastic centers of the empire. If we look at the history of iconoclasm, phase one began when Leo III was empire, emperor of the empire, and it lasted until 787 when the Seventh Ecumenical Council was held in Nicaea. What were the, the issues, or, I'm sorry, what were the events that influenced Leo and people around him to proclaim iconoclasm? There, were a, there was a very serious volcanic eruption on the island of Thira, which is today known as Santorini. And as a result, there was a serious tsunami that uh, engulfed Constantinople itself. The emperor and those that agreed with his perspective said that this was God's wrath and that the empire was suffering because of the sin of idolatry in icon worship. Emperor uh, Leo III basically said icons are idolatrous and that they violate the Ten Commandments of image worship. This teaching was continued by Constantine V. He called the Council of Irera uh, in 754, and that council condemned the use of icons in the church. Constantine V's son, Leo IV, basically looked at this teaching and tried to soften it. And in softening it, he thought that icons would be valuable as, as teaching, but not as veneration. When Leo IV died, he left his son, who was a minor still, Constantine VI, as emperor. But as regent, we have the Empress Irini, who uh, was an iconodule. What were the arguments against icons at this time? First of all, the primary icon uh, argument against the icons were that they were idolatrous. They violated the commandment against graven images. The argument continued that the only true image of Christ was not an icon, but was the Eucharist, that uh, icons represented the worship of the material world. Additionally, the iconoclast felt and taught that God was, un, was displeased with the world because of icons. And this displeasure, displeasure and wrath was illustrated with the natural disasters and several military reversals. Additionally, one of the significant influences was the teaching of Islam that was categorically against image. Who were the supporters of icons within this first phase of iconoclasm? First and foremost was Patriarch Yermanos of Constantinople. Additionally, Post Gregory, Pope Gregory III of Rome, Saint John of Damascus, and then Patriarch Tarasios, who was the patriarch during the time of Saint Irene the Empress. 
the primary supporters of icons at this time were Patriarch Yermanos of Constantinople, Pope Gregory III of Rome, Saint John of Damascus, and Patriarch Tarasios I, who was Patriarch at the time that Saint I that Empress Irene became regent for her uh, minor son. Saint the primary defender of icons was Saint John of Damascus. Saint John's principal writings basically can uh, be summarized in this. He wrote three treatises on holy images and defended the use of images, and it is believed that he wrote these approximately at 750 AD. Additional uh, writings of St. John were uh, the funeral service that we use today, the Easter canon that is chanted at every resurrectional service, and he is also credited with writing the first systematic theology of Eastern Orthodoxy, which basically are available today in translation. So the theology that St. John and those supporters of icons proclaimed is that icons basically re uh, teach and reaffirm the reality of the Incarnation. In icons, we are assured that Christ was seen, touched, spoken to, and was in reality truly a human being at a specific time, historically time. The reality of the incarnation was basically borne out in icons. There was a significant difference pointed out by St. John between worship, latria, and veneration, which is proskinesis. The veneration of the faithful to icons is not the worship of the material that the icons are made up of. Matter is not evil. There was not the worship of images in the Old Testament. The tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant pro prohibited the worship of idols, but they were real. And we worship the creator of matter and not matter itself. These were the basic teachings underlined and outlined by St. John of Damascus. The principal uh, people that taught and that were against the icons, the iconoclasts, were the Emperor Leo V, the Armenian, uh, the Emperor Michael III, Patriarch John Gramatikos, who was the teacher of Michael, and the Emperor Theophilus. These all preached that icons were not proper in their use of the church, in the church. In 787, the Empress Irene, Irene called the Seventh Ecumenical Council for Nicaea II, which is now known as Nicaea II, to end the first phase of iconoclasm. This council was called in 787. The council decreed that icons were valuable and should be used within the church. Unfortunately, starting in 814, there was a second phase of iconocla iconoclasm. Uh, this was led by those leaders of the church and of the empire that once again thought that the use of icons were idolatrous. Their, their principal I argument 
was that the empire was being punished by God and this was demonstrated by their military defeats. They must at this time return to the good practices of barring or being against icons as the iconoclastic emperors had had great military success. They also taught that Christ's divinity prohibits a representations of images showing only his humanity and that as a result that icons were monophysitic. The images could be used as illustrations but should not be venerated. As this phase of iconoclasm grew, there were a new set of people that were defenders of the use of icons. Patriarch Nikiforos, Saint Theodore the Studite, the Empress Theodora, and finally Patriarch Methodius I. Saint Theodore the Studite was the primary monastic defender of icons during this second phase of iconoclasm. He, in his treatise on holy icons, which is available today in translation, repeats the arguments of Saint John of Damascus, but also adds the additional theological concept that the honor and veneration that we pay to the images passes to the prototype. This concept allows us to venerate icons and not worship them. We see that Theodore was extremely influential in stating the theology that was upheld after uh, the second phase of iconoclasm in the Synod of Constantinople. It was called again by Empress Theodora, who was regent for her son, uh, Michael III. It met in in Constantinople in 842 to 843. Uh, it annulled the Iconoclastic Council of 815 and restored the veneration of holy icons. The iconoclasts and all the other heretics were anathematized at this council. It was presided over by Patriarch Methodius I, and it ended and declared the reinstitution of icons within the church on what we now call the Sunday of Orthodoxy, which was held March 11th, 843. We see in this icon, the central image is the icon of the Panagia, flanked by the Empress Theodora and the young Emperor Michael, as well as the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, Methodius I, who wrote much of the service of the triumph of orthodoxy that we celebrate today. He is surrounded by the monastic fathers and the other saints of the church that defended the use of icons that were restored with the Sunday of Orthodoxy in 843. What was the historical climate that influenced all of this in the history of the church? First and foremost, the, rise, the birth and rise of Islam in the Eastern Empire. Additionally, there was a growth of the secular power of the Pope of Rome in the Western Church. Charlemagne became the Holy Roman Empire at this time, weakening the position of 
the emperor of Constantinople in the Eastern Empire. The primary written use are the written documents that translated the documents of the council became known as the Carolinian, Carolingian, excuse me, papers. They were a mistranslation, but they were used by Charlemagne to strengthen his uh, position in the Western Empire. Additionally, at this time, the filioque, which we had said earlier, was uh, grew out of Spain, spread, and its use within the Western Church became much more prevalent at this time. These were the historical uh, issues and events that framed the Council of Nicaea and ultimately the final defeat of iconoclasm in 843.